you've chosen to come here and talk about weed for a while. Uh, what a great group, though. I'm really, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure to get to know Eugenio. Uh, glad to see his friend Carlos is here in from Mexico City. And, uh, and, and Mark and a couple of you guys have you know, made this all possible. Um, the reason I wanted to be in a circle is because um, I think this is best done as a conversation. Um, I know a lot. I work in cannabis. Uh, I've spent five years doing everything from state to local to federal to some international stuff. I've written on drug control. I've written on violence reduction uh, connected to drug trafficking organizations. Um, some of my recommendations have been implemented and have done some cool things, and most of them have not. Uh, you know, most of the things that we do in this line of public policy um, are, you know, it's as, as with anything, and I, so just a show of hands, how many of you guys are undergrads, how many graduate students? Mostly undergrads? Mostly undergrads? Any graduate students in here? No? Okay, all right, cool, awesome. Um, all right, well, uh, anyways, my name is Brad Rowe. Um, I, uh, I got my undergrad at the University of Wisconsin in economics. I came back uh, late in life um, as a 40-year-old, got my master's in public policy here from the Lesson School of Public Affairs. Uh, it was a growing adult dream of mine to sort of make official some of uh, the stuff I had done working with the community. I, was, I actually thought I was going to come back and work in uh, uh, poverty alleviation and in education met a brilliant scholar named Mark Kleiman on my first day here, said that guy's awesome, and he, uh, he was a crime and drug guy, and so I said, well, I guess I'm gonna do crime and drugs. Um, so he became my, uh, my advisor, and he uh, helped me with my applied policy project. Uh, I, did so, I started doing some research for him right away for a company called Botech Analysis, um, and then um, that was kind of, that was kind of uh, the, the beginning of it all. As soon as I, uh, I finished uh, studying, I, uh, I went on to uh, run Botech. He asked me to run Botech after, uh, after I got my master's, and so I uh, ran that company for five years, and about a year ago, I started my own company called Rogue Policy Media, uh, incredibly creative naming. Um, but the media side is actually where my background is from. Um, so I spent 15 years in the entertainment industry, Producing, uh, we were talking a little bit about some of the stuff. I've, I've shot uh, probably about three dozen documentaries, short documentaries for the most part. Um, mostly on philanthropic, governmental characters, people making a change in the world. Um, I was an actor as well, did a whole bunch of little things, some silly movies, some good movies, some, uh, some television, some really bad television. Um, and uh, in order to make this shift into public policy, I sort of let that go for the time being. So I miss it a lot, but uh, that's where the media background comes from. I'm just now starting to bring those two pieces back together. So, um, and the reason is I think there's just a lot of really good stories to be told. Um, I love public policy. It's really interesting. I love cannabis policy. It's really interesting. Um, so anytime you get into a practical conversation about cannabis policy, uh, all of a sudden it just like touches 10 or 15 other things, right? So the second we say, hey, we're in San Luis Obispo and we want to license three new uh, retail outlets. Um, I don't know, why don't you guys tell me, what are, what are some of the things that, uh, what are some of the things we have to think about and who's got to think about it? You guys, go ahead. And Raise your hands. We want three new retail outlets in San Luis Obispo, town up north, a couple hours up north. Yeah. Uh, zoning. Zoning, right. What about zoning? Uh, buffers for, I guess, places where there's children present. Yeah, exactly. So you have, in California, we have sensitive sites, and you have to be, the state recommendation is, you know, 600 to 1,000 feet away from any sensitive sites. Well, the communities can uh, define what are sensitive sites. So it can be an arcade, it can be a water park, it can be a, a kindergarten, it can be a high school, um, it can be whatever they want. Um, in some places, their big thing is churches, in other places it's the local park where the kids go to play sports or you know whatever. Um, and then you get into these conversations with the city council, with the stakeholders, well maybe a daycare is an insensitive site. You say, wait, there are kids there. Yeah, but there's like three and four year olds, right? Um, so is a sensitive site, are we really, what are we really worried about? What, what, are, you know, what, what are some things that families in a community might be worried about? Why is, why is this something called a sensitive site? 
underage use. Right. So are, are we worried about three and four year olds picking up and smoking a joint? No. But we are worried about teens, you know, having to walk past and, and get into a habit of uh, picking up uh, some smokables or some vapes or some edibles on the way and developing a habit that's not so great. Um, so we'll get into some of the positives and negatives, but um, first of all, can anyone give me a somewhat succinct definition of what, what is public policy? Because that's 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 what I do. That's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Can anyone tell me what public policy is? Yeah. I guess uh, public policy is the is the implementation of, of laws. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That's a re that's a really good way of putting it. So basically, anything that touches the public, and that can be from government that can be from government laws. That can be from uh, the way companies intersect with the public. That can be with the way you guys here at an educational institution are dealing with each other. Um, it's the, the distinction between that is sometimes we have internal policy at companies, sometimes you guys might hear about that, that's sort of how employees and management deal with each other. Um, this is really um, about finding solutions in the public interest. Um, and what we do in public policy is we do research, and some of that is uh, qualitative, so uh, if we're trying to figure out, one of the uh, questions we're trying to answer right now, um, and Henny has been a part of some of these conversations, is what is it like now for police officers now that they're not drug warriors and they're trying to protect a licensed and regulated business? What's, what are the differences there psychologically for them? Are they excited because they don't have to waste their time with that stuff and they can go focus on more important crimes? Maybe. Uh, maybe some of them don't like to be relegated to being enforcers of a, you know, basically protecting what is now the equivalent of grocery stores and 7-Elevens. Uh, so it takes away some of the mandate of why they were getting out of bed before is to go, you know, kick some butt and take down bad guys who are doing bad stuff and selling bad things. So do you think that happens overnight that officers are all of a sudden saying, oh, cannabis is okay? No, it's really hard. It's really hard. Um, you know, and think about something that, you know, and I don't know some of the different areas of study that you guys have. You're being indoctrinated right now in your university experience, whether that's economics, whether that's humanities, whether it's education, whether it's plant science. There is an area of study that you know these very learned and smart people and experienced practitioners and academics are saying, these are the rules, this is how we do things. And it's no different for police officers or for, uh, for, uh, for the fire department or for people who work in finance. Um, so it's really interesting when you have these conversations with the people who run the financial departments and they go, oh, so I'm going to have licensees coming in to pay their taxes in cash? Uh, how do we do that? I'm not used to handling five, ten, fifteen, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000. We don't have cash counting machines. Uh, I need to have gloves because uh, some of this cannabis has been out in the world. A lot of it, we need proper ventilation because the, the, uh, the cash that's been around cannabis smells. Um, and that's one of the big things about this industry is odors. Odors is a really big thing. It's a big thing for the neighbors. It's a big thing if you're trying to get away with having to grow somewhere. It's a big thing if you want to have a retail outlet that's sitting next to, you know, some other kind of normal ma and pa shops. You can't have this really strong odor wafting up the front when there's a, you know, you know, when people are going in to buy sandwiches next door. Not for the businesses who are next to you. So how do we get around those things? How do we make it so that this industry can coexist peacefully and happily um, inside you know, the, state, the state of California? So a big thing of what I'm doing right now is I'm working with a company called Muni Services Avenue. Uh, they do really boring stuff like um, cost recovery models. Uh, they do uh, budget audits. Uh, some of the more exciting stuff is compliance audits, so we'll be training inspectors on how to go into places and make sure that they're just selling uh, licensed, regulated pot, and that they're not getting it from their cousin George, who brought it in a duffel bag in the back door. Um, because there's a lot of that. I mean, we grow five times of what we are legally consuming in the state right now. Think about that. <laughs> That is billions and billions of dollars of street value bought that are not accounted for in the Track and Trace program. Track and Trace isn't covering anything right now. It's actually going to be fully implemented starting in January. But if, if, if you 
kind of look at the numbers and say, all right, well, we have this multi-billion dollar industry now in California. Um, the truth is, is that it's five times as large, actually. So there's a lot of people growing and making a living. There's a lot of people who are selling. Maybe they had a medical outlet, a dispensary that didn't get licensed properly. Okay. The, actual, the ratio on that is we've got about, we've got a couple hundred legal businesses. We have over a thousand unlicensed operations still going on in LA alone. So, yes sir. Wait, so are those like dispensaries and licenses? They're dispensaries, they're grows, they're manufacturers, they're, you know, there's some mom pop operations who are making cookies and brownies and selling them to mostly other unlicensed, unregulated operations. So maybe some of you guys have been into these. They're almost undecipherable from the licensed versions of them. So one thing, uh, I thought this was really interesting, and these are some of the challenges that we have um, as we're trying to license and regulate, is LA County was just about to, they're just about to put out an ad campaign. Basically, kind of putting the good housekeeping seal of approval on, on the doors of businesses that were properly licensed and regulated. <coughs> Well, they sort of did the art campaign and tried to put the whole, I also work on the board of advisors for the uh, health impact assessment for, the, for, uh, for LA County. Um, and they wanted to, as part of sort of this rolling out of, of regulation and licensing, say, hey, if you're a customer who cares, you know, and you, you want to go into a shop that is being properly licensed and regulated, um, this is the, the seal that'll be on the door and you can look for that. And if they don't have it, then they're probably not properly regulated and licensed. What are some of the benefits of buying industry regulated licensed uh, products? Uh, it'll be tested. Yeah, testing. So what about that? So you'll know exactly what's in it. So like the THC content, the different types of cannabinoids. Um, you're not just ingesting, you know, like you said, backdoor stuff that you got from your cousin. Like you'll right. know exactly what's in it at that point and how it will affect your body. Yeah, exactly. Great. Thank you. Um, so some other things that they test for are metals. Uh, insecticides. They're not, testing yet test for What's that? They're not testing yet for metals, but they will be. Right, right. So that's, that's where this is all going. Um, pesticides, fungicides. Um, so there's some stuff in there that is not so great. And if any of you are consumers, uh, you probably have ingested or smoked uh, some of these products that aren't so great. Um, one of the things that that creates an issue for is particularly people who have compromised immune systems, uh, if you have respiratory problems. Um, some of these things can be a little more harmful than they are for others, so it's especially important to know what kind of products you're getting. Um, now, is that to say that all products out there that aren't tested and regulated are bad? Um, they're not, but I will say that uh, on some sort of sampling testings that they did in the San Francisco area, they found that over half of the material that they just sort of secret shopped in some different places didn't meet the standards that uh, we're asking to meet under regulation and compliance with the state of California. However, and add another caveat to that, um, some of the standards are pretty crazy. Like they're really like, if you have a tiny bit in your batch, you gotta throw it away. Um, and in some cases, you're talking about people who are throwing away hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of pot. Yeah, I like to add that it's like kind of important that packaging be considered in this conversation because Chinese packaging right now is producing um, chemical seep in to the actual product that's being developed and manufactured. Therefore, it's failing testing when in reality the actual cannabis product is not dirty. Right, so that's one of the, exactly, so that's a great point. So that's one example of what are the constituents of the package. Um, one of the concerns with vaping is you can have the most pristine oil that you're vaping, but the metals that were put into the actual, um, the actual uh, <coughs> heating element um, are uh, giving off chemicals that can be harmful as well. In fact, the little kind of coil that heats up the oil on the inside, um, those are dipped in WD-40 so that they can be stored for long periods of time. So the first time you're, you're taking a hit off of those, you get a nice little, little pop of WD-40. So hope you're feeling lubricated. Um, 
So I mean, there, you know, some really kind of concerning things. The other thing is, is like, you know, what's going on when when you when do you test the product? You can you can have these really wonderfully clean, beautiful terpenes that are pulled out of the plant, but then I put it into a topical. You know, I'm trying to you know some lotion for pain on my neck or my back or my arthritic joints or whatever it is. Um, and the company that I'm buying the lotion from, uh, they don't have proper sort of contamination testing. So we mix them together and your batch fails. So it's really complicated if you're in this industry on the manufacturing side, if you're on the growing side. Um, let's talk about growing for a second. What's, uh, what's challenging about growing good cannabis? Is it easy to just stick a seed in the ground and up pop some, some great uh, yeah? No? You're, uh, you're shrugging your shoulders? Okay. I mean, yeah. Uh, it's only a way to grow, because like, you can't grow with like, like, your own area. Mm -hmm. You can't like, grow in your own backyard. It's untold. Right. Yeah. So some of the problems are visibility, right? Your neighbors can't see the plants. Yeah? Odor, like you mentioned. Odor, right. You're often going to find neighbors who aren't so pleased, especially when those sticky buds start giving, kicking off some, some uh, some big time odors, right? What else? Termites. What's that? Termites. Yeah, exactly. Just like basic plant science. Like you're worried about termites, you're worried about all kinds of different things. You're worried about cross pollination. You know, what kind of, they're, they're male and female plants, right? What are the plants that give off the good buds? Females. What happens if they get cross pollinated with male plants? Termites. Yeah, they're basically worthless. So you got to be really concerned about um, where, how you're, how isolated you're, you're keeping your plants. Um, another thing is, is you know, you can be doing a great job. So there's, there's sort of issues on both, both sides. Uh, you may have an organic apple farmer who's next door, and you're using pesticides. Your runoff might really screw up his grow. On the flip side, you might be trying to grow organically. And you got a neighbor who's using, you know, they're spraying with something that you're not so pleased because that's going to show up in your batch, right? So um, all of these things sort of fall into the categories of, of regulation. Uh, they all fall into the areas of licensing. And um, it just goes to show that uh, with this, whether you want to go from the perspective of this is, you know, God's herb or the devil's weed, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's really how we treat the plant that makes the difference on what's going to end up out there on all levels, on all levels. So one of the big things that we're going to have to figure out is taxation, right? Uh, right now, the effective tax rate on average across California is uh, approximately one. You walk into a store and you pick up a chocolate bar, uh, you know, quarter of your favorite flour, what uh, what kind of taxes are you paying? It's a lot. I mean, it's already like around 40%. Some places a little lower, some places a little higher. Um, the feds are talking about coming in and saying, hey, we're going to we're gonna get cool with this in the next few years. That's a good thing, right? Kind of. <laughs> right? What are they going to do? Tax some more. They're going to tax it some more, right? So it's going to go up into the 50% plus range, maybe even more. So when you're trying to compete with Cousin George, as, as we brought up, you know, who's just growing out in his backyard, or some group that's manufacturing in a warehouse without licensing, um, this becomes really, really difficult. And like I said, again, we're growing five times as much as we're legally consuming in the state. So where, where's it going? East wow. Coast. It's going East Coast, right? It's going East Coast, it's going to Chicago, it's going to Oklahoma, but it's also going to consumers here in California because most of our users up until, you know, six months ago were buying from quasi-medical places. Did, did we have kind of real medical in California before? When I say real medical, it was only for people with serious medical conditions. Right? Was there a way around that? Right? Yeah, anyone who can go online could, could get a card in about you know, three minutes, right? Um, so we haven't, had, we haven't had a model of prohibition here in California since the mid-90s. 
when you have guys in lab coats running down Venice, you know, the, the boardwalk saying, hey man, you, uh, you need a card? Uh, that's not real medical. So um, real sort of more stringent, and, and I, I should get away from saying real, real and, and not real. But you know, when you have states like New York, Washington, D.C., uh, there are different places who have much more stringent standards for access to it. And in California, we had a loose standard, which basically was sort of a catch-all for any serious conditions or pain conditions. Anyone could get a car. So you could come into the doctor and say, Maybe I got a bum knee, and I got to work, and if I could get some cannabis, it would help me work, and you know, they'll give you a recommendation. Um, so it's not that huge of a change of what we have right now. A lot of it is just the reduction of stigma. So it's OK for you know, the, I mean, we're seeing some really interesting, so, uh, in, interesting sociological changes. So what are, how is society changing now that we've sort of said adult use is OK 21 and over? How is, how is society changing here? Anyone seeing anything different than we had two years ago? Maybe here on campus. It's yeah. commercializing pretty fast. I mean, you see advertising, you see billboards for sort of services like Ease. Yeah, right. Delivery, Ease. Um, what else? What are some other, just to, let's talk about billboards for a second. What else have you guys seen? Get High? You guys seen those? There are billboards all over the city. I mean, would you ever see a billboard saying Get High five years ago? No way. Would you guys ever see a billboard saying Get Drunk? No. <laughs> Yeah. So is it a, yes? Where? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I'm just, I mean, maybe you have. I'm just, I'm wondering, yes? I was like, maybe in Vegas, like, depending on where you're mm -hmm. at. Yeah, depending on where it's sort of culturally appropriate. But, so, right, so is it culturally appropriate to have a billboard with, you know, a, a couple of women in bikinis <coughs> saying get high? With kind of wafts of smoke coming across the billboard? That is that been deemed sort of culturally appropriate now. Um, we have done so much as far as like, you know, trying to do responsible drinking campaigns, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. So right now, I mean, it would almost be absurd to think that Budweiser would put a billboard up on Vine and Sunset saying, get drunk. It's Halloween, get wasted, right? They just wouldn't do it. So I think there's probably gonna be some normalization of of what's allowed, um, sort of advertising standards. Um, but I don't know, maybe not. What are some other sort of sociological changes you guys have seen, just out, things you've seen out in the world? Yeah? I was like, going back to the billboard thing, um, as mm -hmm. far as like having, showing like, oh, don't you want to get high? Don't you think that could be problematic over time? Like, what if kids see that? Like, I know one of the arguments was like, oh, uh, the reason why we wouldn't, like, you need zoning laws and things like that. Um, was for like uh, children, or well, I know there was an right. issue with that. So yeah. going to that, don't you think that it would be problematic to have billboards like this up, like for that purpose? I do, I do. In fact, uh, this gentleman right here is wearing a, a shirt from Maastricht University. <laughs> yeah. Do you know about the, the study from Maastricht University? No, I don't. No. It is one of the most famous studies uh, written on. Uh, young adolescents uh, lack of academic performance because of just having access to cannabis. So what happened in Maastricht is they were having a problem in the town square with people coming in, pop tourism basically, people coming in to smoke out. Uh, and the city planners said, you know what, we don't like it, they're not spending a lot of money, they're just coming in and getting stoned and sleeping in the park. So they said, we're not gonna allow anyone who is not a Dutch pass port holder to buy cannabis at Maastricht. Well, that was kind of a problem because there's this big university there. Well, all the German and the English and the American and the kids from anywhere else, they couldn't legally buy pot anymore. So it was a great social experiment, right? We love that. Data just changes like that. So what do you guys think happened? What do you guys think happened to the students who no longer had legal? Could they get pot? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Could they friends? Right, but they made bronze, right, exactly. So what, what happened? What, what do you guys think happened? Is anyone familiar with the study, by the way? There's a guy named Uv Zolatz. Um, okay, but a really interesting, yeah. Before I get a case, so I studied abroad there, and basically that was like a thing all of us kind of wanted to do. We wanted to check out these sort of like all coffee shops in the Netherlands. And it really wasn't too hard to work around. Like some people, it's like, 
you can still get into a bar if you have fake IDs for right. other students. If you have like a student ID, I think they let you in. It's just really like there are a lot of ways to work around the law, and it's yeah. almost just like a sort of like, oh, the government says we can't buy weed, like nice. But so it's still in place. It's, 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 it's still, still in place. Still in it's place still in place, place but it's for not non passport holders. Yeah, but it's all <laughs> work around. Cool. So, um, so it's interesting because there is a workaround. There's always a workaround. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Wisconsin. We always figured out how to get our beer from wherever. You know, um, just what you do. Um, sorry, I'm not encouraging that. Uh, so, just reducing legal access to cannabis, they found statistically significant differences in academic performance for the non-passport holders. All the foreign kids' grades went up. Their performance on testing went up. Statistically significant, especially in the areas of uh, analytical math sciences. Um, a little less for literature and some other areas in history. So um, uh, the, lead, the lead researcher is Olivier Marie. Um, great study to take a look at. Now, why is that of concern if you're a council person here in LA and you have LAUSD with 600,000 students, size of larger than most cities in the country, you're responsible for all these young people and their academic futures. LAUSD, primarily low income. What is the one thing that can help low income people out of poverty? It's the top thing. We all know what it is. You guys are doing it right now. Education. Education. Right. So, increased access to cannabis. Is it a problem? You bring it up? I don't know. Is it? Mm, well, with that test, I don't. It seems like it would be a positive thing, a thing from that point. Um, I think economically, too, it would bring a lot of money in for education. I know that's like an issue, too. Yeah. So, yeah. I think that in a sense, it would be, I guess, positive. Okay, so it can, it can bring some money yeah. in, yeah. but if it's causing academic problems for young people, yeah. just having more access to it, it could possibly something be something that reduces graduation rates or reduces proficiency in uh, math and the sciences especially. So maybe. But that's a really good point. Uh, is some of that money going to make it back to pay for schools? Yes, sir. I was saying it might be important to look at the context in which they originated, or the social economic status in which they, they originated from. You said the majority of LAUSD is low income. Therefore, I would feel like the low income poverty stricken areas or, or people that originated from that um, would be more subject to, I guess, uh, substance abuse uh, across the board, I would say, maybe, potentially. Yeah, I, you bring up a good point, um, and it's it's interesting. Cannabis use is pretty consistent across uh, racial boundaries, across socioeconomics, geographically, um, which also brings up something that is one of the biggest reasons that we wanted to legalize was despite almost no disparity in use between whites and blacks and Latinos, uh, the rates of what were way different. Right, arrests, prosecution, incarceration for cannabis-related offenses. So that's something we're trying to get away from right now. Now, does that just go away um, just because we change the laws? Does it? I try. I, we talked a little bit about sort of changing the minds for law enforcement officers. What are so? I'm just going to give away the punchline right now. Uh, in Colorado, the rate of uh, cannabis-related arrests for young black men has not gone down. It's gone way down for whites, but it has not gone down. So the disparity has gotten larger between whites and blacks. Um, so what they need to do is address that and figure out what's happening. So it's now it's underage cannabis offenses. It's, um, it's uh, possession in school. Um, and what's the other thing that we got to worry about with schools? Uh, again, school to prison pipeline stuff. We don't want to exacerbate expulsion and suspension based on cannabis use or possession. We don't want to exacerbate revocation of probation or parole based on cannabis use. You know, you take a urine test if you're on probation, and cannabis in California anyway is still a condition for a lot of people to have their probation revoked. Revo excuse me. So we're not there yet. You know, we've done this sort of broad sweeping, hey, we got Prop 64, we got legal weed. How many of you guys thought January 1 was like, all right, where's my pot? <laughs> <laughs> I go to 7-Eleven, right? Get a joint? Uh, 
So licensing has also been really, really slow. Um, over half of the cities in California are still in a state of a ban, um, which is upsetting for some people who want to consume, especially who? Medical consumers. Uh, there are people who, um, you know, who uh, have gotten, and so when we have these communities that haven't opened up shops or made it accessible for users, where are people going to get it from? Black market. Black market. Right, exactly. They're going to get it from the illicit market. They're going to find, you know, they're going to find somewhere, somewhere to get it. And traditionally, that has been where consumers have gotten their product, especially heavy, heavy users. So I'm just going to spend a couple minutes talking about heavy users. They are this market. They drive almost every single penny this market's going to make. They drive almost every single problem this is going to cause. <laughs> Your daily, near daily users consume over 80% of the product. Do the guys making joints and edibles care about the Chardonnay moms who are having the kids over on Sunday and they want to pass a joint around? No. They don't care if you don't have a problem. They don't care if you're not using heavily every day. Why is this? Uh, there's, have any of you guys heard of the Pareto Principle? Yeah. yeah? What's that? The idea that 80% of the result comes from 20% of the causes. Exactly. So this holds, did, it, did everyone hear that? All right, so it started out as an econ term. Uh, I think it started out in sales or real estate or something like that. 20% of your customers drive 80% of the market. It's, uh, it, this holds true for alcohol. It holds true for tobacco. It's even more pronounced with cannabis. So it's actually closer to around like 13% of the consumers drive 80% of the market. So there, there are a couple of reasons for this. Um, cannabis doesn't have some of the physical and socio uh, sort of, they call it uh, behavioral toxicity that we have from other drugs and alcohol. Uh, so if I get plastered in the middle of the day drinking beer or whatever, it's a little harder for me to show up at work or to drive my car. Uh, if I'm a heavy opioid user or a heavy cocaine user, it's a little harder to function. Um, because of the way that cannabis works with our cannabinoid system, we very quickly develop uh, dependence. So your tolerance goes up very quickly. If you tolerance use, isn't the same as dependence. Yeah, right, dependence. exactly, exactly. So your tolerance will go up quickly. Um, and for heavy users, there is a higher uh, number of people who develop um, a dependence issue. We try and stay away from the word addict just because of sort of, or, or addiction, uh, just because of the negative connotation. Speaking of that, someone brought up black market before. It's one of the things I try not to use, um, especially here in LA or in any other communities. Um, a lot of people are just very upset about the connotation of black being bad and black market being something that's Afro-American centric. So uh, I try to stay away from, from that language, even though it's something we've used for a really long time. Um, so yeah, as far as tolerance is concerned, you're using more. And so as we use more, tolerance increases. So your daily and your daily users consume several times a day, and their usage, when they're using, is a much greater amount than, say, the naive or just occasional user. Your naive occasional user can get a buzz off of three to five milligrams. That's not going to touch a heavy user. Uh, they're in more of the 10 to 25 range, right? So you do that a few times a day. What is actually a very cheap product can actually become a little bit expensive. Um, so cannabis, the per, the per stoned hour is kind of how we measure it, right? It's super <laughs> cheap. I mean, compared to alcohol, if I'm going to go out and have a good, you know, whooping time on a Friday night, I'm gonna blow a fair amount of cash. If I wanna be good and stoned with two or three of my friends, I can do it for about $15, right? Versus closer to 100 bucks to do the same thing with uh, a few friends if you're out at the bars. I know you guys can do better if you bring the case home and keep it in the fridge. <laughs> um, so, um, so that, that's another part of the sort of lack of stigma or the allure for um, continued use, daily use, um, is that it doesn't hit the bank as hard. 
is if you're trying to do the same thing with, say, like Vicodin or Percocet or Darvocet or uh, Oxycodone, you know, some of these pills that run, you know, sometimes five, 10, 15 bucks a pop. Um, all right. Let's move on to state stuff. So we're, we're going to try and, I'm going to try and blitz through everything in an hour and then we'll We'll do questions or sure, yeah. After something like whoever, that. whoever wants to stay to ask questions. Okay. Or you could yeah. have to go at seven or whatever. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and I'm happy. I know I've been asking you guys questions. It's kind of trying to keep this a little bit conversational. Um, so California, when we legalized, we doubled the size of the cannabis market in the United States. Um, just LA alone, LA County represents uh, depending on what you're looking at, fully a third to a half of that market. So LA County, Southern California, is the largest cannabis market in the world right now, legal cannabis market. Uh, with that position, you guys are sitting at a really interesting place. Um, that means that the largest cannabis market is being regulated, is being licensed, people are making money from it, people are trying to regulate it, people are trying to tax it. As you guys get out of school, whenever that is, you guys are going to have a lot of opportunities if you want to try to work in the industry of the plant, or of its sales, or of its manufacturing, of its regulation, of the enforcement of the laws, of the writing of the laws. Um, it's all happening here. Um, and as someone who has been scurrying around the, straight, uh, the state trying to work with city councils and with stakeholders and different groups, trying to understand what this rollout looks like. Um, it's great to be here in LA. Because you're like, well, <laughs> you know, it's like they're trying a lot of stuff here. They're trying a lot of stuff in Oakland. They're trying a lot of stuff in, uh, in other cities across the state, in San Francisco. Uh, equity considerations. This is a totally, I mean, it's not, it wasn't invented, but Real implementation of equity considerations. Can anyone tell me what are equity considerations for the cannabis industry? Anyone know what that is? Trying to undo a lot of the harm that's been done by the war on drugs and the communities that have been affected by that. Right, great. So, exactly. Trying to, so reparations, sort of trying to put that into into the code, into the law. Well, that's not the right word. But into the, into the, right, exactly. Reparations uh, is not the, the right word. Well, so it, it's actually interesting in some of the ways that the, um, that the codes are being written and being um, put out there as far as uh, focusing on areas that have had disproportionate numbers of arrests. So trying to come in and actually either bring in funding that is sort of tax money being brought in um, or it's using money from state coffers uh, to try to support um, businesses that are run by people uh, who are in LA, it's 80% of the average median income, uh, or live in zip codes that have been disproportionately affected by the war on drugs. Um, so in some cases it is direct money that's brought in to serve these groups. And another way that it's sort of directly trying to repair some of the harm is uh, you actually get merit criterion points uh, if you're hiring or if you have uh, people in your ownership structure who have been arrested for a cannabis-related offense uh, 2016 or before. Um, and some other cities are, are, are going along in that direction as well. So this is really interesting. Now, it's an obvious thing um, as, what's your name? John. John. As John brought up, um, there, uh, you know, there, there's an obvious sort of connection for the cannabis industry, right? Uh, war on drugs, uh, there were a lot of people who were being penalized for being in this industry, and all of a sudden we see a bunch of rich white guys who have deep pockets and funding swooping in, opening up the businesses and sort of taking over where other people five years ago were getting locked up for it. So there's sort of this obvious injustice where you go, we can try and fix that, we can try and make that right. Um, what about using equity measures for new industries that come into California? you know, new technologies. Would it be obvious if we were to say, hey, we have this crazy new uh, mini 3D computer that I can wave with my hands and uh, we're gonna try and do equity considerations for this new technology industry? Would you guys kinda go, hmm? What's the connection? 
right? But we're actually writing this into our laws in a lot of cities across the state. There's city councils for the first time having this conversation about what it means to think about groups that haven't gotten a fair shake. And yes, disproportionate arrests and some other things were very punitive for certain neighborhoods and certainly across racial lines, most heavily on black men. But what about using this idea for new industries? Um, by the way, this isn't being done across the country. Colorado is not really doing it, um, as far as I've seen anyway so far. Oregon's not really doing it. Um, so I hope that you guys are in a place looking at the city of LA, uh, looking at our state, looking at Oakland and some other places that are really actually putting their money where their mouth is and, and putting money into the coffers to make sure that low-income uh, mom and pop business owners can you know, have some money. It's hard to start a business. I mean, it takes, it takes a couple of years before you turn a profit, even if you're selling um, a fairly high margin product like cannabis products are. Um, but again, you gotta pay your taxes. Uh, what are some problems with running a business? Um, say, on the accounting side. 280 e What does that say? That says that you have to pay three times as much in taxes as any other business, federal taxes. Right. And so you can't write off, you can't write off. Anything that's not related to cost of goods sold. Right. Not okay. employees, not advertising, not sales, not your technology, not your furniture, not your property expense. So not a lot of people are making money in this business because of the 280 considerations. Maybe they'll fix that next year, but. So that's 280? 280E is the part of the tax code that says you can't deduct normal business expenses for illegal operations, which this is at a federal level. Right, so that is, that is huge. Is that going to be around forever? We don't know, but it is making it very hard for people to make money in this industry, especially small business people. So um, right now you've got thousands of people, thousands of small business owners you know, in this sort of green rush, trying to get these licenses for cultivation, for manufacturing, for dispensaries. Um, and it's gonna be very hard for a lot of them to get through the first couple of years. Uh, in fact, a very good number of them will fail. And that's gonna be a really rough deal. So what happens when businesses fail? Other businesses come in and sweep those up. So there's gonna be a lot of consolidation in the next five, 10 years. Uh, where are some of the big players maybe going to come from that we haven't seen a lot of? Or, do you have questions? Yeah, I have a question yeah, about yeah. the difficulties about starting a weed business. Is it mostly difficulty obtaining a license or just turning, like making it work out financially? Like, how hard is it to obtain so, sort of distribution? The answer is both. Okay. Uh, getting a license is, uh, is actually very easy in some places. Uh, but some of the prized ones, like getting a dispensary uh, in some of these communities that are limiting it to one or two or three, are, it's very competitive. In fact, um, one of the things I've been working on are developing scoring criteria for cities um, so that they can sort of allow, express their values as a community. Uh, we've done it for Santa Ana, we're doing it for um, San Luis Obispo. Uh, we're trying to set it up for some other Bay Area communities that are looking towards legalization. What does that mean? Um, the cities are looking for business partners who are going to come in and participate in things that will benefit the community. So they're going to give volunteer hours, they're going to give money to the local Boys and Girls Club, they're going to use uh, recycled materials in their build out, they're going to be green and friendly, uh, they're <coughs> going to allow uh, labor peace agreements. Um, at a lower threshold than the state threshold. So does anyone know what the state threshold is for triggering uh, collect their version of collective bargaining? 50 employees? It's 20. It's 20. 20. So yeah, they were tossing some different numbers around. They ended up at 20. Um, so some different communities are saying, hey, we're going to, you know, the kind of businesses we want in this community, we want to have living wage jobs. We're going we're gonna to try and do this um, at a lower threshold. We'll try and do it at 10 or 5 employees. Does anyone know what a labor peace agreement is? It's kind of collective bargaining light, <coughs> call it that. Uh, it basically means if I'm running a business, I can't prohibit union representatives from coming in and talking to my employees. They can 
post stuff in the lounge. Uh, you know, people during their lunch break can sit around and talk about unionizing, you know, some of that stuff. Um, but on the flip side, you know, I allow that, but you also can't shut down my operation. You can't just all walk out in the middle of the holiday season, or if it's a grow, you know, right when it's time to do all the trimming and picking, everyone can't just walk off and threaten to, uh, un unless they can unionize. Um, so it's a moderated uh, collective bargaining arrangement. Um, all right, is, any, is everyone either, is everyone here planning on staying in California? Are you guys moving to different states after you graduate? Who's moving out of California? Where, where are you going? Back to Belgium. Back to Belgium, all right. All right, so, yeah? I'll probably go to Europe. You're gonna go to Europe? All right, maybe you guys should get on the same flight? Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm from Connecticut, so probably back to these states. Okay, maybe go back to Connecticut. Anyone else? All right, everyone else maybe plan on staying here in California? Okay, all right, cool. Um, so there's a lot of interesting stuff happening across the country, right? Uh, you know, just next week, we're gonna have some referendums, some initiatives going, uh, some, some measures. Um, we got uh, Illinois, Michigan, um, who else, a couple, couple uh, Arizona guys, poor, poor guys in Arizona, they just got booted again. Uh, they're, they're not gonna get anything up there. I mean, they've tried so hard. Uh, Ohio is going to wait till 2020. Um, so there are, there are some different states that are moving the way of, of legalization. Um, Massachusetts uh, has already uh, decided to legalize, uh, but I don't think they actually have any stores open yet. We're trying to figure that out. Uh, Vermont did something cool, or interesting I should say anyway. What did they do? They're the only state in the country to have done it so far. Their legislature actually voted for for legal adult use cannabis. Every other state has done it through a proposition, through a referendum, through, a, through some type of public uh, sort of uh, voting. Um, what did we do here in California? What was our what was our instrument that we used to to push for legal cannabis here? Prop sixty four. Prop sixty four. And so. Did Prop 64 say that, what, what, did it, what did it say? What did Prop 64 say? It said that they needed to put in a structure to allow people to get access to cannabis um, recreationally without a, a doctor's note. Right, so really important thing that he said, we have to put, we have to put in a structure. Um, and in California, we gave that power to the cities. So that the state is the ultimate one in control, the Bureau of Cannabis Control. But uh, the cities and the counties are the ones who are actually issuing the licenses and making the decisions on who they allow to open up businesses in their communities. How is that different from Washington, D.C.? It's legal, legal to smoke in D.C.? Well, how, how, how is it different here than it is there? They ran into some major roadblocks. There are no, there are no shops. There's no, there's no structure for for selling or taxing or manufacturing there. But if you want to grow and smoke, you can. You just can't do it in public. Basically, all the smoking rules apply. You can't, you know, you can't smoke in a public. Uh, 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 and actually, I don't think you, you, yeah, you can't smoke on the street. Um, what are the restrictions here for using in LA? You can only consume in a private residence or in a licensed event. Um, it's kind of it. Yep. If you yeah. come in here as a tourist, there's nowhere that you can legally consume cannabis. Right. You can't consume unless, in your hotel unless you're in a private residence away from the public. Right. So how are we going to maybe get around that? How are we going to open up the opportunities for people to use in semi-public spaces? Assumption lounges, West Hollywood is going to open. Assumption lounges, right. Assumption lounges, so events. Events, so on-site permits, event permitting. Um, what have you guys seen as far as like event permitting for cannabis so far? I used to work at like a, a sesh is what it's called. And it's like a sesh? Yeah, it's like a kind of tiny convention where you can, other people like sell weed and they sell like different kinds. They have like wax, they have a flower, they have different kinds of edibles. And it's like almost a small community where you can all smoke and feel safe in that environment. Okay, and that's, and that's permitted. That's exactly. It's what? Farmer's market. Like a farmer's market for weed. And what's the physical layout of the section? So it's like a big room, you typically, and there'll be like multiple little booths, and you basically uh, 
you go in, you show them your rec or your ID, you go upstairs, sometimes you have to pay, most of the time you don't. Uh, you go upstairs and then there's all these things available to you. There's usually like a little area for you to sit down to. So as far as what we And is it for the most part bring your own or do you, uh, no, you, you can, buy you, you buy, buy the, stuff there? It's you like buy the, farmer's market. So okay. there's, there's like different things for sale. They have stuff free typically too. Like you can try the product before you even like buy it. They're usually really nice about it too. It's like sometimes it's like mom and pop businesses, but sometimes it's also like companies that are well established at that point. Yeah. So do you guys think that uh, sort of lounges or anything will be sort of as, as prevalent as bars someday? Yep. yep. Question in this scenario, can you bring your own? Uh, yeah. Um, so again, I come back to the question, how have things changed with society and so far? I mean, I've, I've seen some really interesting stuff. I mean, I was at a bar mitzvah two months ago, mm -hmm. standing around talking to a group of dads and Two of them had vape pens in their pocket, and we're just kind of pulling them out and taking a hit. Small. We're sitting there talking with you know a bunch of thirteen-year-olds running around, not thinking anything of it. Yes. Um, like you mentioned earlier, the green rush has a lot of sort of investor capital flowing yes. into these space, which is going to drive a lot of innovation. So I actually kind of want to turn that into a question, if possible. Yes, please. What sort of innovation do you expect to see in the this space, maybe in terms of like new innovative business models or yeah. distribution? Yeah, that's a great systems? question. It's a really great question. Um, so and there's actually a group you guys should kind of uh, check out on what it's doing. Um, Eugenio has been a part of uh, what's going on with the UCLA Cannabis Research Initiative. Um, and we as a group are looking at, uh, there are some guys who are just you know really great with the medicine, really great with plant science. Um, I'm looking more at public policy stuff, um, criminal and juvenile justice impacts. But um, I think that the, oper the, the reason I'm bringing this up I think a lot of the opportunities are going to come, ironically enough, in medicine. Uh, even though we've had medical cannabis forever, we haven't been able to test it properly. Uh, just this last year, the FDA approved um, Epidiolex. Uh, we've also got Marinol, which is out there, and these are two, so one's CBD, one's got THC with it as well, um, that are be being used to cure medical conditions. Um, we're going to see, I think we're going to see a lot of new medical products um, being used for different things. We're extracting terpenes now. Um, there are hundreds um, of different compounds in the plant. We haven't really looked much at most of them. Uh, I mean, what are the kind of top ones that we have any idea of what they do? Can anyone tell me? What's, what's out of the plant? Come on, guy. What, what, do, you, what, do, you, what do you guys smoke? Well, what, do you smoke? what? <laughs> cannabinoids or terpenes? <laughs> Uh, anything, anything that's psychoactive. Let's let's just say psychoactive. THC, CBD, THCV, CBD, CBDA, THCA, CBG, CBN. Yeah. Okay. So some of this stuff is the stuff that gets you high. Some of it uh, offers some pain relief. Uh, we've seen some uh, some uh, positive effects for people with anxiety or with seizure disorders. Um, there are some promising studies along the lines of uh, cures for things like cancer. Uh, uh, obviously, people have used it a lot for nausea. Um, so, I, you know, the, the plural of anecdote isn't evidence. So, and I, I really, this is a very important point. The bud tenders you guys are buying product from, and I'm just saying you guys rhetorically, I'm not saying, you know, I'm sure no one in here uses it. Um, <laughs> your butt tender, first of all, doesn't know what he or she is selling. They really don't. They can call it Girl Scout cookies, they can call it Elmer's glue, I, whatever, I, they can call it whatever they want. They don't actually know that's what they're selling. Uh, because these are popular strains, guys in Riverside are saying that they're selling what the guy in Humboldt is selling. It's very confusing for the consumer until we have track and trace in place. Seed to sale, or seed to society, or whatever you want to call it. Until that is actually implemented, you don't know what you're buying. You really don't. And that was another thing that came out of this sort of secret purchasing that they did. The THC amounts were just way off. And you know, the stuff that was being sold that they said was 25% THC was 10. The stuff that they said was 10 was 25. 